welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Elaine Carney Gibson. And she's here to share with us her new book, Your Family Revealed, a guide to decoding the patterns, stories, and belief systems in your family. So Elaine is a practicing psychotherapist for almost 50 years. She sees individuals, couples, and families specializing in relationship therapy. She also taught graduate courses in marriage and family therapy for many years and is the director of the Marriage and Family Therapy Training Institute of the Link Counseling Center in Atlanta, Georgia. So welcome to the show, Elaine Carney Gibson. Thank you so much. So delighted to be here. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. What inspired you to write this book? Well, it's been a book that's been a while in the making. I taught uh, graduate courses in marriage and family therapy for a number of years. And uh, my students would be reading these books that they found to be, you know, at times hard to understand. And they, I would get up in class and I would explain the theories and kind of, a, I think, thought was a simple way and a way that they could use. And they would sometimes say to me, why don't you write a book? <laughs> And um, I stopped teaching those courses in 2014 and finally decided, okay, maybe it is time for me to sit down and write a book that talks about these different ideas of the family systems theory in a way that makes it understandable. People can read it and say, oh, yes, I recognize that. Oh, that's something that I don't want to do any longer or gee, um, that's that's really a problem for me at this point in my life. I want to do something different. So it's really about a tool to people to, for people to have awareness and understanding that will allow them then to have some choice that they may not have realized they have to transform their life so that it can be uh, more rewarding for them. And get they can be more in alignment with what I think now is being referred to as true self. And that they can honor their own thoughts, their own beliefs, their own feelings. And that that is important to have a satisfying life and relationships. Okay, there's so much I want to unpack there. So I guess we'll just start from the beginning. (laughs) So for a lot of people, I mean, what is it, you know, what's the importance of really understanding how our families operate? Well, like I said, I think that family systems theory came came out of humanistic theory, which believed rather than looking at pathology and deficits in an individual, that it's looking, uh, they wanted to look at the idea that relational patterns and experiences as much or more than uh, the... (laughs) physiology, perhaps, or chemistry, uh, plays a part in how a person feels about themselves and their experience in the world, and then how they do relate to other people. So I became pretty fascinated with this idea early on in my career, which is in the early 70s, and just found it to be so helpful for folks and that they had an awareness, and they got some knowledge and awareness that then the power that gave them, the power to choose to transform, to do something different for themselves and in the relationships. So it seems to me like a useful uh, model and um, one that I I obviously believe in. I've practiced it for many, many years, and I work with individuals and couples and families. But with everyone I see, I approach the um, the therapy time and, and experience with them as knowing that they have come from a system and they're currently living in a system. And the system starts off, of course, in our, our lives with a very small unit. And then it kind of expands out from that. We have our, uh, our family, our, our immediate family, our extended family, our immediate community, our larger community expanding it out to the world or perhaps even the universe. And so um, we're we're all living in systems. <laughs> and so to understand about that and how that impacts us, I just think gives us more power 
to uh, choose about how, how we want to think and feel about ourselves and relate to others. Now, are the stories that we're told about ourselves or maybe our family, are those what influence us and define us? Well, absolutely. I think that's a huge part. And I'm always interested in those stories because I think they do. It's not only the stories themselves, but the meaning we give the stories. So the family has the story, which can be a generational uh, story passed through the family. And then each individual in the family assigns meaning to that and tries to figure out how they fit in and how they're to believe and go about being in the world. And So, yes, I think stories are very important, but there's other things to look at as well. There's the patterns in the family of how they relate, how they communicate, what are the boundaries, uh, what is the structure, the hierarchy in the family. Um, Are there family triangles? Of course, there are. There always are. But some of those can be pretty functional at times, and other times they're not so much. And so uh, just having some idea about uh, those concepts about family loyalty and legacy and and how that works in a family, about family secrets and how family secrets can impact families for generations. Uh, so to me, it's just all interesting and important. So as families have secrets or ways of viewing themselves, and you talk about this lasting for generations, Are they even aware of this sometimes, or is this somewhat of a subconscious thing that's just kind of playing in the background? Well, I think both are true. I think some folks, there's this, there's this something that goes on and they can't maybe have a feeling about it, but they can't name it. They don't really know it specifically where other people operate on those stories. Those stories are told over and over again. And then they, uh, operate out of some belief. I, I give an example um, in my book of a, a gentleman in his mid fifties who was very, very depressed. And when I listened to his story, his story was one of immigration, and his family had been persecuted and had great difficulty assimilating into a new country, and so he carried that story with him. And as we explored the story, he made the choice. He could be one, he could live in their story and the meaning they give, gave to it, which is they were always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And so there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. And he decided that that was no longer true for him. Yes, it happened. It was a terrible, terrible thing that happened for his family. But that 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 idea that you were waiting constantly for the other shoe to drop and living in such intense anxiety for him then kind of got transformed into a great depression, that he could stop, he could choose not to have that belief, that he could get up in the morning and go forth with his day, thinking about what he could create in a way that could be positive for him, rather than living out of that belief system that the other shoe is going to drop. So it's those kinds of stories, myths at times, that I want to help clients explore. Again, to give them the power to choose to do something different, both in the way they think, the way they feel, and and the way they behave. And so if someone knows they're having problems in their life, but don't even know where to start. Like, where do we start with our family stories have been shared or the assumptions we have in our family? What are some ways that they could start to pinpoint that and really start asking questions? Well, again, you're right. They, people come in with many different levels of awareness. And um, if, if they coming in and they don't have any idea about the story, or let's say the story involves a secret, They don't know the secret, but they know something doesn't feel quite right. And that's what I'll often hear from clients is that, you know, something doesn't feel quite right, but they don't know what it is. So they experience that in their body. Something isn't quite right. Uh, Another example that comes to mind is, um, and this was a, a client that an associate of mine was seeing, and the client um 
learned much later in his life upon the death of an aunt that this aunt was actually his mother. The woman who raised him as his mother was this person's sister. And he always had some sense that he didn't quite know who he was, but he didn't know why. And once this secret, this family secret, came known to him, it things fell into place for him. And it was as though he could then uh, truly identify, oh, I have a self and my self is okay. And this whole idea that there's something not quite right or something missing is not about me as a person, but about something I didn't know that has impacted me, but I didn't know how or why. So they be, you know, people just begin to uncover. It's a, it's really, uh, I think for me, obviously I've been doing it many years, a, a wonderful, fascinating process. Um, you know, a little bit like an archaeologist where we just start scraping a little bit off and we find a treasure and then we find more treasures and can talk about then how that can tra be transformed so that there's something internal that shifts as well as how you are relating to others in the world. When families start to go through this process of exploring what their myths and secrets and stories are, do you you find that most or have you experienced where like most the of the people that are doing this are really kind of kind of upsetting the apple cart in some way within the family structure? Well, it can be. Absolutely. Um, I find that to be, uh, 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 well, that part can be true, but I find that to happen more when maybe an earlier part in doing the therapy work where we begin to look at um, the boundaries in a family and and the triangles in a family. And so a person is not really truly honoring themselves, but are trying to pacify others, do what others expect, and in doing so, lose themselves. And as they begin to have more sense of who they are, their true self, their own feelings, their own wants and needs, and they begin then to give themselves voice to express that to other family members, that's when I see that that's upsetting the apple cart because other people may not want them to change. They may want them to stay the same. And so, you know, that's that can be a little harder process. But uh, in the long run, I think if they can stay with that and at the same time, be respectful of the other person or other people. So it's how can we do that? It's a question for all of us. How can we honor our true selves and give ourselves voice and at the same time be respectful of others and compassionate towards ourselves and others? So it's not an either or. And so again, that's a place where I see the upsetting the apple cart happens most of the time. <laughs> Well, thank you for going through that. It, it just seems like there's so many structures and you talk about some of the subsystems within a family. And why is it important for us to know those? Well, I think subsystems are important because I think how family structures itself is important. Um, in a family, there kind of needs to be a functioning executive subsystem. And, you know, I talk with a lot of um uh, individuals and they grew up in a family where there really wasn't. It, it was kind of everybody was uh, uh, on their own and they didn't feel secure and they didn't uh, know who they were or were their place in the family. So I think having some kind of structure is very useful and important in the family. And years ago when I taught parenting classes, I would it, some parents would say, well, you know, it is my responsibility to, to be the parent. Absolutely, I agree. But it's also your duty. Now, how you go about doing that, you know, are you fair? Are you flexible? Are you a, a, are you someone who you, the child particularly can reach? <laughs> um, are, are you available? 
And are you providing a safe and secure environment for your child to grow? And that's ideal. And so um, it is important to look at structure. And it's also important to um, think about, again, when I talk about boundaries, what are the boundaries between the subsystems? If there's a parental subsystem, and that may be one parent, two parents, that may include a grandparent who's doing a lot of um, helping raise the children or some kind of a helper, a nanny who's helping to raise the children. How is that subsystem supporting the child? And then for the child to feel like, again, like I said, that they they know they have a safe place and they know what to expect. And it's not a free for all or it's not so rigid that they get fed, they get clothed, but they don't feel loved or they don't feel a connection. And then, of course, we know there's been a lot written about attachment and it, um, so that's a whole nother subject, but I think it plays into this piece about uh, boundaries and hierarchy and ways of relating. So as we dive into the structure of our family, is it important for us to identify what our family values are? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think that's true all along the way that we want to know about our family values, because I think that we do, you know, it's, our, the family teaches us about that. And sometimes that works very well for us as we become more independent from the family. We carry those values and that works well. Other times it does not. It, it almost impedes us because we've grown to have a different perspective of the world and we may then develop a different set of values which may conflict with what we uh, how we were raised, what we grew up with. But I think it's a very important part of family is sharing the values and helping uh, the young young people along the way. What we would hope would happen is that there would be some respect that as the individual matures, that they then can decide whether, okay, this these are important. This is how it works for me. I have a little, or I have a little different perspective, and can that be respected in the family? Uh, so that often is a space, place of conflict in a family when that happens. But again, it's allowing each individual to try that on. Do these beliefs serve me now? Is it, or is there somehow something about this that's causing me to feel less than, or causing me to? not relate to others in the way that I would really like to relate to others. So we want to take a look at all of that. So a family that has clear boundaries, they're firm but flexible, I think works as a much healthier family than the family that has the rigid boundaries. There's no room for discussion. There's no room for opposition. There's no room for disagreement. Uh, or the, the family that's so diffuse that, that again, is just nobody's quite clear about anything. And the child is just left out there on their own to try to figure the world out, which is a hard thing to do for any of us at any time, point in time. So, yeah, I think that the functioning dynamic of the family in terms of how it's structured is very important. Do you tend to have a lot of adults come to you to investigate how their families are structured and how they can use that information to heal themselves? Yes. I think that I, that's particularly true with adults who have come from families that are very rigid. And that may be that, that the rigidity has to do in the relationships in the family, that the parents are kind of, it's one of those, the family that maybe the children are to be seen but not heard. The children don't feel they have a voice. Uh, the children, you know, there's, there's so many strict rules. In fact, when I first started in the field, and I think this is still true, we got we were one of the first family therapy centers in the country, in the place where I, I work in Atlanta. And a lot of times the families that would come in, they're coming in because a teenager is acting out, misbehaving. And it'd be so interesting to me as I would look at the structure of the family, because it often fell into the, the the extreme camps. 
the family was either too rigid and the teenager was trying to break free of that rigidity. So it was breaking the rules and misbehaving. Or the family had such diffuse boundaries that the child was trying to get the parent to be a parent, to pay attention, to be available in some way that was, you know, in charge. And it was always fascinating to me because it would be almost one or the other. That didn't wasn't to say that there weren't families to come in where there were pretty clear boundaries uh, and that there was a problem going on. That certainly happened. But when there was a child that was acting out, it seemed to either fall into, okay, there's too much separateness, there's too much rigidity, or there's everybody is just a blob and there's not a sense of someone being in charge. There's not a sense of safety. There's not a sense of direction. And that child was needing and wanting attention. So that just always kind of fascinated me. I can understand why it, it's your whole book is very fascinating. There's just so much great information in this. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. And I'd love for you to share with our listeners, you talk about identifying communication roles. So what does that mean? We take on different roles in our family and we communicate out of that role. There might be the peacemaker. You know, you, you can tell me to look at family and say, okay, that person's the peacemaker. Uh, or that person is the devil's advocate, or, you know, so so we have roles in our family and we often communicate out of that kind of that role. There are rules in families, rules in families, maybe one of that would be, uh, you're not allowed to talk about feelings. And I have heard that a lot in my career, that feelings weren't allowed to be discussed in the home. It's like, get over it. You don't, you don't, not supposed to have that feeling. And so there are rules that we follow. That I remember, this is always kind of fascinating to me too. This isn't so true anymore. And I, I'm glad of that. That it was okay for males to be angry, but not females. And so I see these families, and the, the father or the, the sons would be expressing anger, and the women would be sitting there, the girls very passively, and they weren't to express anger. But on the flip side, the males didn't express sadness. So where the women or women and females would cry, the men didn't. And we certainly have come a long way uh, with it being okay for everybody to have their feelings and to express those appropriately within the family. I talk about in that chapter, and it goes into a lot of you know detail about kind of whatever unhealthy communication practices, what are healthy communication practices. This isn't new stuff. We People have been writing about this for decades, but because I included something about communication, I wanted to, to put it in there. My father had a saying that I loved, and it's the name of my chapter, which, which he'd say, uh, say what you mean and mean what you say. And that's how I what I call the chapter. How safe is it to say what you mean and mean what you say? And When I've asked that question, when I'm sitting with a family, I don't even need to get a verbal answer. I can look at each one and see their facial expressions and their body language, and I'll know the answer to that question. And that's one of the things that I want to work with them, is that that family can become a safe place to have voice, to say what's important to you, what you feel, believe, want, and need. It's safe. And when you say something, that you mean it. You're not just going along. You're not just being nice. Sometimes, of course, we do that in relationships, and we need to. But that it, you can you can say what you mean and mean what you say. So if I say no to a request, I mean, no, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm taking care of what feels important to me. I share in the book that, you know, as this was a famous little saying that we had back in the 70s and 80s that I had a sign on my refrigerator and it was a common thing. And it said, you know, what part of no, don't you understand? And so I'd be in the kitchen and I had three sons and one of them would ask me, they wanted to do something and I would say no. And then they, of course, keep trying 
to ask over and over to get me to change my mind. And I got to the place where I'd do this little tap dance and point to the sign. I wouldn't say a word. I'd said no. I mean, no. There's not a discussion around it. And so, okay, I, I mean what I say. I want to say it in a way that's respectful. I do want to hear them in terms of, okay, maybe there's something else I don't know that they want to share with me. That's always important. Uh, but generally, in these cases of the things they wanted to do, it's like no, the answer wasn't going to change. And observing families, young families, and how many times a child would have a fit and the parents then would change their mind and give in to the child. And I always felt like that wasn't really fair to the child because then how can the child trust that someone else is in charge? And children need to know that they're not the ones in charge that there are there is someone who's in charge. And so I always felt it was kind of unfair to give in to the child. Again, I think there are always those times where we want to hear something maybe we didn't know, or we want to encourage our child to talk about their feelings about something so maybe we could understand where they're coming from in a way that would help us have a different take on whatever it is they're presenting. I found it fascinating in your book how you talk about uh, like a lot of this stuff can be really identified by just looking at how they spend their mealtime together. And I thought that was so just very interesting because I think a lot of times people don't realize the importance of that, but there's a lot of importance. Oh, yes. That's one of my favorite questions is to ask, you know, how, how do they spend meal spend mealtime and who gets to speak at the meal? And what do they get to talk about? And I felt very lucky growing up. There was a family of five, my parents and um, two siblings. I had a brother and a sister as the oldest. And it, we always had our time together in the evening, our dinner, unless there's some special occasion or athletic event or something, of course. But generally, we sat down together. It was my father insisted. We sat down together. We had a meal together. And we talked. And nothing was off the table. So as we got older and we had opinions that had, may had to do with religion or politics or whatever, we talked about it. So it was a real shock to me when I grew up and went away from home and learned that for some families, they weren't allowed to talk politics and they weren't allowed to talk uh, religion and they weren't allowed to disagree with one another. And I thought, oh, I'm so glad. I was raised in a family where we could agree to disagree, and we might have quite a debate sitting at that dinner table, but it was all okay to disagree. But when I ask a family that question, and then I listen to whatever the presenting problem is, what brought the family into therapy, I can often relate it to what is happening at the dinner table. and. I, I, one person I saw that was just so striking to me when I started really asking this question was when I had a client who was the youngest of 12 and never got to eat dinner because they, no one ever called this child to eat. And time the child would get to the kitchen, there was no food. The food was gone and no one seemed to care. So this person had very low self esteem, was very depressed finding it really hard to function in the world. Well, when I heard about the mealtime, that told me about everything I needed to know. And so I thought, I'm going to start asking this question. And here, okay, do, um, do, does everyone have an equal voice at the table? Does the youngest one not? Or do the girls not? Or this, who, who sits quietly? And who dominates the conversation? And do the roles show up? Is someone the comedian? Is someone the peacemaker when they're at the table and there's a disagreement? How does that work at the dinner table? So it really gives me a snapshot into the family dynamics and what is working and what could be improved upon. It really puts things in the limelight because one of the things I was impressed about is how you talked about 
awareness is a first step towards change. So if we're not even aware of what's going on, how can we make those changes? Well, that's my belief, man. It's really why I wrote the book is I thought, well, you know, this isn't something that's just, a lot of this is talked about. Of course, communication just talked about many, many books. And there are a lot of good parenting books out there and have been over the years. But I, I thought some of this really, we don't talk about it much and it can be very useful for people to understand a little bit more about it, how it worked for them, how it works in their current families, how it could be different in their relationships. Um, and so, you know, that was my idea about writing the books. Well, maybe this could just bring some awareness. And with that awareness could come choice and healing. It seems that we're in this great age where a lot of people are asking these questions, regardless what age they are, about their family, their family with dynamics. How much does our family, you know, the roles that we play in our family um, shape our habits or our values? Oh, I think it is it, 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 tremendously. I think that the roles um, and the way the family communicated, the beliefs of the family, so much impact us. I, I, examples coming to my mind right this minute, and I do I, I put this example in my book, is a, a woman I was seeing, and again, right this minute, I can't remember her, her age, but she was uh, probably in her late 60s, early 70s, and her spouse had passed away recently. And so she had uh, been a caretaker of him for a long time. And something she'd always wanted to do was travel. And she didn't, they never traveled. He didn't like to travel. So she was thinking she might want to do that. But a friend of hers invited her to go with her to France and specifically to Paris. And my client really wanted to go, but she was terrified. And as we started to explore that, uncovered the um, story that her father had been in World War II, and he had landed on the beaches of Normandy, and he had said he would never go back. He would never go back. And that was his story that he was sharing over and over. And so she didn't even know that that had gotten so inside of her that when this friend invited her to go on this lovely trip, she she wasn't sure she could do it. Now, if they were going to go somewhere else, maybe. But the, this woman wanted her to go to Paris and then out into the countryside uh, south of Paris. And so when we realized this was her father's story, this was his belief, this was his fear, this was his grief, and that she did not, she can honor it, but she did not need to carry it as hers. And then she decided to go with her friend. And when she came back, she reported having a marvelous time, just a wonderful time, and how glad she was that she discovered what her fear was really about and that it wasn't hers. And that she could go on this trip and have this wonderful time. So we do carry so much in us that we have picked up, you know, either as sponges by being in our family or because we've been told, and that's kind of the dogma of the family, and we need to stick with that. And when we are then thinking, well, I'm not sure that belief works for me, uh, then, you know, it's pretty scary. It's, it's pretty scary. So we want to be loved and accepted, but you know we know we're taking a risk sometimes, particularly in a very rigid, dogmatic family, if we're going to decide to believe or to do something that the family may not approve of. Yes, it all plays a part. It's so interesting in how this is so interconnected. I think a lot of times people don't realize just the family dynamics and how that really shapes not just who we are, but who we're becoming. So do families tend to run into dangerous territory when it comes to secrets? And if so, how can we approach this with compassion? Yes, I think, you know, and it's, to me, there's not a one size fits all here. There's not an answer. It's not that, sh that th there was a, a kind of a, thinking for a while in the field that secrets were, you should should never keep secrets. 
Well, I just haven't found that to be true. I think there are times that that a secret is something that it needs to be honored and is important for some reason. And yet there are many secrets kept that are impacting others and the others don't know. It's like the example I gave earlier about the gentleman whose mother uh, was the person he thought was his aunt. And, 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 uh, how that cha- changed things for him. So I think that family secrets, and often this is generational, that that there's a lot of shame that may be tied to a, a family secret, and the person carries that shame with them, and it becomes internalized about who they are. And then, of course, that impacts how they feel about themselves how they relate in the world. Now, I do believe in privacy, and I try to help clients separate privacy from secrets. I think every everybody kind of deserves privacy. We get to have private thoughts, and we that we're entitled to our privacy. But when it impacts someone else, and the impact has some, it could be detrimental, but not always detrimental, but but impacts them impacts them in a way that 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 alters their life, and yet they don't know it. Then I think it can become dangerous. Uh, so it's making that decision: what can you share, what and when, and how do you do it? So often early, this isn't as true now, but a um, number of years ago with there was a suicide in the family, that the family often didn't want anybody outside the family to know. They wanted to keep that a secret because there was guilt and shame around it and that they didn't tell children. And so the children often will pick that up at some level. So it's not so much important to keep it a secret, but how you tell a child, what's the age appropriate language to tell the child so that that they can deal with this loss. And they do at the center uh, where I'm working, the Link Counseling Center, they do offer um, children's groups for grief. And they work with children, you know, four years old and up. Um, and so they, they're working with them around loss. And often this is losing a family member by suicide. So that, but that was a point in time where that, that was just something that families didn't want others to know. And then it impeded off the healing of the members of the family and the children who didn't know the story grew up pretty confused. And once that the families, and often that was in my office, where they would learn about the story, that then there was some healing that could take place. And the family could join together in a way that became supportive um, and could help each one of them move forward in their lives. If there are family members who are not okay with you know, sharing secrets or accepting them, is that where that compassion comes in, where we just allow them to be where they're at? As you're saying it, it just resonates with me <laughs> that, that that would be true, that they, that they're to have compassion. Uh, I think that's always important. I think that we talk a lot about self-compassion these days, and I I love that. I love the idea of self-compassion. What I find for um, many of us, and and this is a little off the subject of your question, but I'm kind of going there from that, is that for self-compassion, I've found that, that it's important for a person to learn to nurture themselves. That self-compassion is almost like an idea. It's 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 a belief. And uh I'm wanting to move that into a feeling. And I find that the often the way to best help clients do that is by helping them to learn how to self-nurture. And so that's uh, really often a big part of the work. So, yes, you want to have compassion for others, that they are where they are, and that you can have compassion for them where they are. 
but also that you want to have compassion for yourself and that you support that by nurturing yourself, by self giving yourself that um, comfort and affirmations, support that your child self needs, I think, in order just for the idea of self-compassion then to take root. In your book, you talk about there are powerful ways to heal the wounds of our past and strengthen the qualities that we cherish. So how do we go about doing that? Well, I think one is to identify them, to be aware of how we kind of got where we are um, in, in our past, from our past experiences, and then how, what meaning we've given that. Can we create new meaning? And can we then um, choose? Can we realize we have choice? I, I love this um, example that one of my supervisees uses with her clients, and I don't know where she got it. I don't think she made it up, but she may have. It's, it, I just think it's such a fun little example. She'll talk with clients who get so focused on the negative. The negative may be about themselves, usually something about themselves or about their lives and how bad it is and how there's just no joy in their life. And and so one of the examples she will, will share with them, say, okay, she said, think about it's the morning and you walk outside and there's the most beautiful rainbow you've ever seen. And you're looking up and it's so amazing. And you step in a pile of dog poop. So what is your focus for the rest of the day? Are you going to focus on the fact that you saw the most gorgeous rainbow you have ever seen? Are you going to focus on the fact that you stepped in dog poop? Because you have that choice. You have that choice. What is going to be my focus? Where am I going to put my energy? Yes, they both happened. Where am I going to put my energy and my focus? And that is then how we begin to shift out of the negative self-talk that we all get into. We are all talking to ourselves all day long. You know, I talk in the book about communication, and that's basically with others. But we have this self-dialogue all day long. So what is our self-talk? What are we saying about ourselves? What are we saying about our relationships? What are we saying about the world we live in? Can we see the gorgeous rainbow and hold on to that? And so I think a lot of the work is really helping people realize that they have choice in what it is they want to think and feel. Now, most people understand that about thinking. They don't understand it about feeling. But we actually have a choice about that. We may not in the instant. We feel angry. We feel frustrated. I mean, all that happens in the instant. But then once we're past that, we have a choice. Do we hold on to the anger? Do we hold on to the frustration? Do we begin to look at that in some other way? And do we want to give it different meaning? So all those things are in our um, our, our possibilities for us. What are the possibilities? And where do we want to take our lives and our experiences, not just in the future tomorrow, but right in this very minute? And we have a choice. So again, that to me is kind of the crux of my book. Okay, have awareness, and out of your awareness, then give yourself possibilities to do something different, to think something different, to um, feel something different, to behave differently, and then make choice to move forward and create what it is that you want your life to be and you want your relationships to be. What a powerful exercise to do because so many people get stuck in that negative mindset. And it's easy to think about, oh gosh, you know, I, I, I stepped in dog poop instead of focusing on the rainbow. Yes, it, it, it is. So that's why I loved her, her love her example that she uses with her clients because I just think it, it's, and again, I don't know where she got it, but I just think it, it really, you know, it really brings it, to, it makes it clear. 
It makes it clear. And of course, in the moment, you know, you have that frustration, but what are you going to think about later in the day? What makes it a good day or a bad day? How do you decide that? And that's often about not just what happened, but how you then choose to frame that and to think about it and to feel about it. So so it's all a choice? It, to me, it is about choice. And I, again, I think it helps us to have understanding and awareness so that we can then move from a place that we may not even know we are. You know, we, don't, we, we can't often make new choices if we don't understand what, what we're doing now. If I understand I'm focusing on the dog book rather than the rainbow, but I don't know that. That's just kind of how I programmed my life. It'd be to focus on the negative, but I'm not really aware that I'd be even doing that. And I'm probably not going to change. But if I have some awareness that I'm doing that and I have another option, then I have choice. So that's what's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is. <laughs> well, and I, I just, I, cause there's so many people that are looking to like unearth what is, you know, causing them issues or stress or anxiety right now, it seems like at this time in history. And so, yeah. you know, through reading your book, it, it has me kind of thinking, well, you probably have in, in, and maybe this is just the great question here. It's like, do you have clients that come to you and they know that their family dynamics a little off, but they're just not sure how off it is until they start doing that self-investigation? Yes. And that's one of the reasons why at the end of each chapter, I have kind of a, a page for reflections and questions, because it's not just reading about these concepts, but then applying them to your own family, both your your past family, your family of origin, and a current family that you may be in, how to uh, uh, to take that and look at it so that then it's like, okay, I, I, I have an understanding now of, um, all right, so my sister always calls me when she gets in a fight with my other sister and she wants, tries to pull me in the middle, and I don't like that, and I don't want to be in the middle anymore, and I know it. But I haven't really identified it as being caught in a triangle. And then I don't have a whole lot of tools how to get, I want to get off or out of being in that triangle. And, you know, the number of people that come in to see me who've been a parentified child. So, and a parentified child is that the child is expected in many ways to behave and think and have roles in the family that um, would be more in a, a, a parent kind of um, subsystem. And that has caused them harm. And they, they, when they realize, oh, gee, I've been usually pulled or put in that situation, but that was as a child. I don't have to stay in that kind of position as an adult. I have a choice to do it differently. So that they can, um, you know, again, it's all about understanding, awareness. And so when I break down some of these different models and different patterns and relationship uh, styles that are going on in a family, then I think hopefully that just gives people a, a tool to say, oh, yeah, that happens in my family. Or, oh, yeah, uh, we do that bad communication uh, thing. And so maybe I need to stop that and, and do something different. Well, Elaine, it has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work and become part of your community? Well, um, I do have a website, ElaineCarneyGibson.com, and I, they are able, people are able to leave me a message on there. It comes through as an email, and I do respond. Um, so I, you know, I would I do trainings, I do workshops. I don't have anything set up right this minute that I'm putting on my website. Thank you so much for this interview. I've enjoyed it, <laughs> enjoyed getting to speak with you. So uh, yeah, they could reach out. They could always uh, contact me through the website, and uh, the book is available. Um, that sounds true. Uh, I think it's available different places that they can find it if they're interested in it. Uh, so I, I just really appreciate your visiting with me today and asking such wonderful questions.
Well, Elaine, it has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Your Family Revealed, a guide to decoding the patterns, stories, and belief systems in your family. Your Family Revealed is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember to support our indie bookstores. You can also purchase this book from the publisher, Sounds True, at SoundsTrue.com. To learn more about Elaine and her work, please visit her website, ElaineCarneyGibson.com. On that note, we're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after these messages. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.